but I think we're going to get this thing started. Uh, I hope this finds you all safe and well. My name is Peter Maravellis, and on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers, I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of City Lights Bookstore's in-store calendar during the shelter in place. So though we are unable to hold events in the store, we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with online readings, discussions, and forums throughout the month of August and into the fall. Uh, we are happy to say that City Lights has finally reopened its doors to the public. Of course, following San Francisco Health Department guidelines, uh, we aim to make our reopening as safe as possible for everybody. But please do come and visit us. You'll be able to once again browse our stacks. Our business hours are seven days a week from 12 noon to 8 p.m. And we have actually worked very, very hard to transform the store and make it more conducive to visiting in the age of COVID. Our entrance is now on the Broadway side of the building, which is actually at 271 Columbus. The original entrance is an exit only. So we do encourage everyone, please do wear masks while visiting. Uh, as many of you know, City Lights is a publishing house as well as a bookstore. We continue to publish books in the grand tradition of Lawrence Ferlinghetti's Pocket Poet series. Each year we publish books of poetry, literature in translation, uh, as well as books on current events. Uh, we've recently published books by such authors as Stan Cox, writing on the Green New Deal, uh, David Barsamian uh, on the U.S.'s retargeting of Iran, uh, also a book on selected works by activist Julian Bond. Uh, we even entered the young adult market, uh, producing a book on the life and activism of Baird Rustin. So in addition, we've got new books coming up in the next season from Juan Philippe Herrera, Pamela Sneed, Caribbean Fragosa, Seshu Foster, and many, many others. So to learn more about the books that we publish, uh, check them out at our website, www.citylights.com. You can also visit us under social media. We were on Twitter, Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, uh, and so on. So this event is going to be rebroadcast on YouTube at a later time. So if you know anyone that could not make it tonight, uh, refer them to the City Lights Live on YouTube page for more information. So today's event is being presented by City Lights in conjunction with University of California at Berkeley's program in critical theory. Uh, we've hosted some really wonderful events together in the past. So it's a real pleasure and an honor to be working with them once again. Um, we're thrilled to be presenting Martin Jay in conversation with Paul Brynas, celebrating the release of the new book, Splinters in Your Eye, Frankfurt School Provocations. There it is. <laughs> by Martin Jay, published by our friends at Verso Books. Verso is the largest independent radical publishing house in the English-speaking world, based in London and New York, and founded in 1970 by the staff of the New Left Review. They publish over 100 books a year, and City Lights carries them a full range of their books at the store. Um, the book we are celebrating tonight fits beautifully in their long list of titles that have featured such authors as Tariq Ali, Terry Eagleton, Frederick Jameson, Rebecca Solnit, as well as many other esteemed writers. So Splinters in Your Eye is a beautifully crafted selection of essays, a testimonial to a life's work of deep thinking about the Frankfurt School and many of its aspects and, and where we stand in relation to it today. So a word about our author, Martin Jay is a Sidney Hellman Ehrman Professor of History Emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley, where he taught modern European intellectual history and critical theory for 45 years. Uh, among his works are The Dialectical Imagination, uh, Marxism and Totality, uh, Adorno, Permanent Exiles, Findesequel Socialism, and much, much more. Uh, he's been a regular columnist for Selma Gundy since 1987. Uh, he's gonna be joined tonight by Paul Brynas. He is Associate Professor Emeritus uh, History at Boston College. He is also the author of Tough Jews, Political Fantasies, and the Moral Dilemma of American Jewry, and co-author of The Young Lukacs and the Origins of Western Marxism. Uh, a significant fact about his background, he was a member of the Student Council on Civil Rights when he was arrested for his participation in the Freedom Rides during the summer of 1961. So as part of the Freedom Rides, Professor Brynas, along with three others, traveled to Nashville, Tennessee, uh, from Nashville to Jackson, uh, Mississippi, via a Greyhound bus where they were all arrested. Uh, this was on the 21st of July in 1961. So really an honor to have you, sir. Um, today's discussion and reading will be followed by a Q&A. So please post your questions via the chat function uh, 
that's located at the bottom dashboard of your screen. So just scroll your mouse or trackpad over the bottom edge and then it comes to appear. Um, we'll also be posting links for you to purchase copies of Splinters in Your Eye. So please do support Verso Books and City Lights. Right now, indies need your help to survive. Uh, we're not out of the woods as far as COVID is concerned. Uh, every little bit helps. Uh, and there's really no better way of showing your commitment to indie book selling than to buy a book. So um, to open the evening with an introductory statement, I'd like to welcome Robert Kaufman. Uh, he is no stranger to City Lights. We have worked together in the past, delightfully so. And uh, Professor Kaufman is Associate Professor of Comparative Literature at UC Berkeley where he also teaches in and is former co-director of the Interdisciplinary Program in Critical Theory. His teaching and research emphasizes several interrelated areas, the Frankfurt School being one in particular. Uh, Professor Kaufman is the author of Negative Romanticism, Adornian Aesthetics in Keats, Shelley, and Modern Poetry, and is at work on two related studies, Why Poetry Should Matter to the Left, uh, Frankfurt Constellations of Democracy and Modernism after postmodernism. Uh, so, welcome everybody to City Lights. Rob, I think you've muted yourself. Let me unmute you. Is that better? Is that working now? That's good. Okay, we yes, can hear you now. Is. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, thanks everyone for being here virtually uh, the ways we can these days. And uh, just want to say that the program in critical theory at UC Berkeley has been so fortunate to work over the last 15 years or so on a number of programs with City Lights. And we were really thrilled that City Lights this spring, when like a lot of other independent bookstores and related kinds of venues around the world in the arts and in culture, uh, suffered uh, their own kinds of financial how will we make it crises amidst the pandemic. Um, there was a great upswell uh, locally, nationally, and internationally to support the store. And we'd just like to ask everyone to do everything they can to continue doing so. I just want to say a few brief words uh, to add to Peter's introduction and then turn it over to Marty and Paul. Uh, many readers know already, and those who don't will enjoy the pleasures of discovering in this new book by Marty J. Splinters in Your Eye, Frankfurt School Provocations. Uh, the special place that Marty's work has had since the early 1970s uh, in discussions of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory of Modern History and Culture and quite a number of other fields that link up to it. Um, it's fairly well known and of great importance still that by coming, as it were, from the outside, the United States in that case, to a German context, that was still roiling with debates about the Frankfurt School by participants in it, Marty had a very special place in being able, uh, not exactly dispassionately, but in a sense uh, with a remove that was passionate itself to contribute to understanding in new ways, a past and a present and the possibilities of where the thinking, the critique and any kind of taking up of active stances in relation to it that might continue. Uh, to put it mildly, that's as relevant today as it ever was. And the title of this new book, which is in a sense, uh, not only a, uh, a reflection back on the, some of the origins of Marty's work, but it recaptures the sense of Marty being able to see in ways that few commentators have, not only the obvious provocations in Frankfurt School of Thought, but some of the aspects of it that are um, perhaps more provocative than one would think of, less of any particular kind of line that one might have been able to predict, uh, leftist or otherwise. And Marty has always added to it, and the other meaning of this subtitle is his own provocative sense of uh, not coming out in the expected places which is in its own way, the best tribute to critical thought anyone could have. Peter's already read some of the more important works. And I'll just add that one of the things that Marty's work has been able to accomplish is to constantly, instead of assuming it 
ask the question of what the value of the sort of thinking, what historical determinants and context it does have, what it can generate. And um, that's enabled him in his own way to do things that perhaps are not the thing most associated with his own work, a certain kind of activism in which he invites, for example, at the Centenary Conference for Herbert Marcuse that he organized in 1998, Angela Davis to give the keynote, and in which almost in a kind of um, taking up of some strains of what Marty brings, uh, a discussion that she gave of certainly her own activism, but also what it meant to her to read and discover, as she put it, the excitement of thought itself uh, in staying up all night in Marcuse's seminar to prepare to present on Kant's first critique. That's the sort of thing that Marty's work has brought in a kind of generative dialogue. It's hard to think of a better way to honor it than having uh, Paul Brynus as his interlocutor tonight. Peter mentioned some of Paul's work and I just want to add that in addition to the books that Peter mentioned, um, there's a wonderful book that you can find that has, among other activists arrested in 1961 in Jackson, Mississippi, for participating in uh, Freedom Mississippi Summer 1961, uh, there's a book which is called Breach of Peace, Portraits of the Freedom Riders uh, by Eric Etheridge. You'll find Paul's 1961 police mugshot. Uh, his own life of activism and of scholarship and teaching as well uh, puts him in a, a really great position to be uh, one of Marty's great interlocutors and certainly tonight to get things started. It's really a pleasure to have them and to have everyone here. Uh, thanks very much and I'll turn it over to the two of you. Thanks everyone for coming. Robert, thank you. That's, I'm gonna go home now. That was, <laughs> was too nice. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone, for coming and uh, give, not watching the Republican National Convention. Um, I hope that we're less frightening than that. And um, I, I don't know. It's, I, I can start out with some thoughts, but uh, Marty, maybe you want to... We've had so many conversations, you and I, over these things that it just feels like we're in the midst of talking. Uh, well, I, I would just simply add, uh, first of all, my thanks to Peter and to Rob for organizing this. It's a genuine uh, thrill to be uh, doing this at City Lights. Uh, I don't have to mention uh, or belabor its iconic status. And I certainly hope that the, uh, the survival of, of a place like City Lights uh, is something that uh, needs to be taken seriously as a task rather than simply assumed as a given. Uh, as for our relationship, the one book that was not mentioned that Paul was involved with is a book, a book called Critical Interruptions, which he edited back, must have been 1968 or nine, 70. maybe 70. Yeah. Uh, a book of essays on Herbert Marcuse, the very first, I think, English language text that uh, tried to make Marcuse relevant. And Paul and I met each other back uh, in the 60s uh, and began discussing this material uh, with a kind of uh, immediacy and excitement that really uh, was unusual for dissertation projects. Uh, in other words, my dissertation project at the time was much enlivened by the fact that I had interlocutor Paul, who was simply uh, engaged in a kind of committed way to seeing what could be taken from Marcuse and Adorno and others uh, and uh, made meaningful uh, in the uh, the current crisis, that crisis uh, being, of course, the 60s. And now, 50 plus years later, we find ourselves having a discussion in which some of the ideas, not the same ones necessarily, still have a kind of uncanny resonance. And our crisis is not the same as the crisis of the 60s, but God knows it has as uh, strong an existential claim on us. And as the Republican Convention is going on, as it were, in the background, you, know, you can almost say that they're reading, uh, giving dramatic readings of Leah Lowenthal's Prophets of Deceit, uh, you know, as a kind of text for their own speeches. Um, all of this material has a, a kind of uh, potential still to be not only thought about, but also uh, to stimulate 
to provoke. And so I'm anxious to hear what Paul wants to uh, elicit from the book, how the book is being read, and what uh, issues we can talk about in, alas, only the 45 minutes we have left. Yeah. Well, this, I think, um, the one of the interesting things to me about this book, which mm -hmm. I think Splinters in the Eye is a, is a, a terrific, terrific book. It's, um, and Rob Kaufman and Rob, in your introductory remarks, you touched on something that I think is, um, is quite pertinent is that Marty's work is famous um, among those who appreciate his work. He has his critics and opponents who would probably have other things to say, but that aside, um, Marty is known for his, his balance, his judiciousness, his consideration of different sides of an argument, his, your, your attentiveness to to uh, perspectives other than your own. Um, and that's often seen as uh, an aspect of Marty's work, which is, lacks a certain kind of passion. And that's something that I, 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 this book puts the lie to that notion. I mean, th this, uh, his grasp of the, the, I noticed Marty, for example, that in the book, I was struck by how often you use the term yearning, the yearning for redemption, the yearning for reconciliation, the yearning for an end to the horrors um, that you capture with a great deal of passion, the passion of the Frankfurt School and its, its yearnings for um, an end to various of the nightmares that we, that we live in. And I was, was uh, very moved by uh, experiencing that, witnessing that in reading these pages, which are, are filled with, with the most subtle and, and, and compelling forms of political and moral passion and the capturing that in some of the Frankfurt School theorists. The thing I want, that I, I began to think about was questions that I've never asked you and that have to do with something that surprises me because we met in I think probably 1968 uh, in Widener Library, thanks right, to a mutual right. friend of ours, Tim O'Gilmore. And Marty was at that point working on his dissertation, which became the dialectical imagination. And I was doing work on my own dissertation for the University of Wisconsin on uh, Georg Lukacs and Karl Korsch and their Marxist texts of 1923. And, um, the question I didn't ask you at that time because, and it seems sort of extraordinary that I, I mean, I now wish I had, but what drew you to the Frankfurt School in the first place? What, what did you find compelling about it then? And I asked this question also because dialectical imagination is now part of the history of the Frankfurt School. Um, it's not just the history of it, but uh, as the second essay in this book with uh, Marty's relationship with Max Horkheimer, one of the original theorists, uh, and their role, his role, and the role of Adorno in, the, in kind of the, 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 the forming of dialectical imagination. In the last chapter of the book, where Marty discusses the alt-right and this kind of mad anti-Semitic neo-Nazi um, focus on cultural Marxism and the Frankfurt School's role in, in um, leading to the end of Western civilization, uh, dialectical imagination pops up again. It's present, it's, it's, it's here in this particular moment. And the, 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 the moment we were in when you wrote, worked on your dissertation was not quite as dreadful as today, but it was a quite explosive and volatile time. So I'm, what, what, what drew you to, the, to these guys? Well, how did that happen? Well, it's a question I've often been asked. And I give basically two, uh, what I would say, standard answers. And I've started to give a third one, which is a little more reflective. The two standard answers are these. First, uh, I studied with H. Stuart Hughes. Uh, he was a participant uh, in the OSS with Marcuse and uh, New Franz Neumann. And so he was personally connected to a number of these uh, figures, but also was very interested in the intellectual migration from Germany which in the 1960s was still uh, not yet uh, an historical topic. Uh, a lot of these people were still alive. 
there was an unawareness uh, of the importance of people like Hannah Arendt or Henry Kissinger or Hans Morgenthau, or of course the Frankfurt School. And so the larger question of what the impact of the migration was, was part of the background. But then the more exigent question was what I would call the mystery of Marcuse's origins. Because Marcuse was a figure who really was uh, in some sense arguing in a tradition that was utterly foreign to the one that we were schooled in. Uh, a tradition which drew on Central European thought broadly understood, uh, German idealism and Marxism uh, with a certain psychoanalytic dimension thrown in, in ways that had not been really uh, part of the American vocabulary for, uh, well, I don't know when it, it ever was actually. So the mystery of, of who this guy uh, you know, was, where, where these ideas uh, were coming from, led me to the larger context, uh, the school out of which he emerged and you know, which he advanced, but also to a certain extent departed from. Now, the third reason, which is the one that is in a way more personal and more problematic, although more honest, is that the Frankfurt School represented a very interesting intellectual cum cultural formation. These were uh, highly educated, gebildete German Jews with whom one could identify in what might be called a culturally aspirational way. That is to say, one wanted to have their level of high culture. One wanted to be able with Adorno to write about Schoenberg or with uh, Horkheimer to uh, understand Kant or, uh, and I could go on and on. In other words, a certain sense that these were people who were uh, highly, highly educated in the way the German Jews uh, traditionally were understood to be at least a certain class of them. And yet at the same time, they turned this in a radical, critical, uh, transgressive direction. So there was a kind of possibility of identifying with them as exemplars of uh, a certain kind of, let's call it a normative or aspirational notion of high German Jewish uh, excellence, and yet not turn that into conservative, uh, self-satisfied direction. Uh, and so I think that was part of the attraction, uh, you know, the desire to be in that larger world, to feel comfortable in that world of high culture, of building, of uh, truly educated uh, men, and there were no women in it at that time, the gender dimension was not part of it, and yet also feel that this could be, uh, despite uh, what might be seen as the natural inclinations towards conservatism, could in fact lead in a very critical direction. So that was, I think, the sort of, if I have to look back on it, subconscious motivation, trying to sort of combine those two, uh, uh, you know, so somehow um, significant not fully articulated, but nonetheless powerful uh, motivations. That makes a great deal of sense. I, I, I like that. I wonder if um, one of the things that, that uh, you talk about in dialectical imagination and with partic it's particularly fascinating in the, the chapter, the second chapter in splinters in, the, in your eye, um, where you discuss Horkheimer and the dialectical imagination, and there you were in Germany talking with these men who you were drawn to uh, in the ways that you just vividly laid out. Um, one of the themes that's there, and one of is is the the theme of the complicated and and uh, nuanced relationship that the Frankfurt theorists who, and most of them were of, of Jewish background or were Jews, um, their complicated relationship to, to being Jewish. And I always found one of the appeals that, that the Frankfurt School thinkers had to me as somebody who was brought up by Jewish parents who were atheists and had no religious background whatsoever, that attaching myself to the Frankfurt theorists was a way of being Jewish. That is their very ambivalence, their very hesitance to say, yes, we're Jewish. Um, I liked all of that um, as, and, and, and was, was drawn to it. I want to throw in a parenthetical question. <laughs> I realized in figuring of things, thinking of things where, of, that I haven't uh, asked you about and then I realized, I, re I'm, I confess to complete ignorance, what role did, did, did Israel and Zionism, the creation of Israel play 
in the, in, in, in the lives, I say in Marcuse's life, in any of their lives. I mean, it was, um, I, I, I'm shocked that I know, know really nothing about that. Right. It's a very useful and uh, well-researched recent book by Jack Jacobs, which deals yes. with uh, critical theory. And there's a very, uh, I think, nuanced discussion of the Frankfurt School and the question of Zionism. And it's very complicated. I mean, it turns out the most critical member of the school when it came to Zionism was Eric Fromm. Fromm was an internationalist, a humanist who was not in any way prone towards nationalist uh, and particularist uh, sentiments. So from the get-go, from uh, I think even before the creation of the State of Israel, he was quite critical. The other members of the school were not, I would say, deeply involved. There was a very brief moment in which Lowenthal flirted with Zionism in the 1920s, gave it up quite quickly. But by 1948, and uh, well through the period uh, 20 years after, until the uh, 1967 war, the Six Days War, they identified with Israel as a place of refuge for Jews who had been uh, endangered by uh, Nazi extermination. So even though they understood uh, the claims of the Palestinian, uh, set, uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, people who had been there before, they felt a kind of, I would say, more powerful identification with the Jews who were trying to survive in a world which was still uh, dangerous. So Marcuse went to, uh, to Israel uh, in 1971 and had an interview uh, with, uh, uh, with Moshe uh, Dayan. Uh, and we have the, uh, the actual recording of, of his uh, discussion. And although he criticized holding on to the lands after 67 that uh, the West Bank and so forth that were conquered uh, in that war, he nonetheless told Moshe Dayan that he understood it as a defensive war against the Arab states trying to annihilate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Zionist state. So uh, Adorno and Horkheimer in 1956 uh, said that they thought in the Suez crisis that Nasser reminded them of uh, the Nazis or fascism at least. So there was, I think, a general sense uh, that yes, there was a case to be made certainly for Palestinian rights, but that they were never part of the uh, anti-Zionism, the radical anti-Zionism that captured large segments of the uh, German left in the 1970s, even to the point where some of them became terrorists, uh, the number of uh, really ugly incidents in the 1970s. Uh, and of course, Adorno didn't live long enough, nor did Marcuse, or certainly not Horkheimer, to really see what Israel has uh, become. And so it's hard to know where they would have fallen uh, on the spectrum now. But at least during their lifetimes, except for the uh, one case of Eric Fromm, they had a strong ambivalent attitude with a great deal of sympathy for Israel as a refuge for the Jews, without being religious, without being nationalist in any strong sense, but in a pragmatic sense. So Adorno, for example, remained very close friends with Gershom Sholem and uh, never got to Israel. Sholem invited him. But clearly, uh, Sholem was a, a much more... Uh, dedicated Zionist, he of course moved to Israel, moved to Palestine initially and stayed in Israel. And Adorno, I think, never criticized Sholem for uh, his uh, choice. So it's a very complicated issue. And uh, the whole Jewish issue, we could talk about this for days, is of course uh, fraught uh, with many different, uh, uh, both dangers and I would say um, also opportunities to take seriously the role of a certain kind, as you say, of uh, diasporic Judaism. Uh, which is not religious, which is not nationalist, but which is also not assimilated, which knows, in fact, that there is something in the Jewish experience, if not the Jewish tradition, which uh, is, uh, in a way, in cahoots with transgressive and uh, uh, liberatory and emancipatory inclinations in general. So the particular struggle of the Jewish people to be emancipated from a variety of, uh, of uh, of prejudices and uh, uh, institutional, uh, uh, what we now call structural racism, that this had a larger implication to the theories that uh, were developed and which they held on to. I recently did a piece on the late George Steiner that's coming out yes, of yeah. Alma Gundy, which I think I sent you. And Steiner was a figure who, uh, in language and silence in particular, represented a position which I think 
is very close to the one that they upheld. Uh, a kind of pride in being diasporic, in being uh, not particularly religious, although of course some of them, like Fromm and Lowenthal, went through a religious period, but taking seriously the substance of uh, Jewish theology, as had, of course, Walter Benjamin, and uh, refusing to be a, a simple, um, and then, uh, we can argue about whether or not uh, it had problems and so forth, but nonetheless, it's a uh, one worth taking very seriously still today. Yeah, oh, that's, you know, it's, um, thank you, because now I, I have, yeah, and I'm gonna, I, I, sh I will uh, get to Jack Jacobs's book. That sounds like a, a gap in my um, understandings. So thank you for those thoughts. I wonder also, just to stay with this, not, I don't want to wear it out, but to stay with it a little bit, um, there, there were a lot of people uh, participating in this now know the, um, the book that I'm about to mention, which is uh, Isaac Deutscher's uh, collection of essays that was published in 1966, I think, called uh, The Non-Jewish Jew and Other Essays. Um, and that notion of the non-Jewish Jew uh, was one that I, and I don't know whether you did, but others sort of uh, at certain point attached to the Frankfurt School and said, that, well, this is, they're cosmopolitan, they're not immersed in a Jewish tribal uh, configuration, um, but they're, they're uh, nevertheless Jews in some sense. And that's the thing that interests me because it occurred to me shortly after that essay, which I liked a lot, and I think Deutscher's perspective was a very uh, compelling one, the idea of the non-Jewish Jew. And he starts with Spinoza and Marx and Rosa Luxemburg, Trotsky, Einstein. These are figures who, who are Jewish, but not completely in Jewish. They're, they're on the borders of a number of cultures and civilizations, and they have, they generate a very interesting perspective because of that. One of the things that struck me is that in the late 60s and early 70s, when I was meeting you and meeting a lot of our contemporaries who were going into academia and were getting interested in the Frankfurt School of theorists, that a lot of them were not Jews in their background. And I thought, oh, look, they're non-Jewish Jews too, but they're really non-Jews. That is, they're people whose background has, they're not there. <laughs> and all of the Frankfurt School, uh, most of them, I, uh, the German Frankfurt School, the Habermas's generation and the generation after Habermas is not a Jewish generation. And I think there was something compelling. It's interesting, it compelling in the, non, the figure of the Jewish non-Jewish Jew for non-Jewish non-Jewish Jews, if I can put it that way. That is, there's a way of identifying with the Jewish figure by, on the part of somebody who's not Jewish. And this was all, it was also very, it was easy to do for, for males. It was, I think this became a much more interesting and complicated thing for females who were interested in the Frankfurt School theorists. But that's always struck me as an interesting phenomenon. The number of um, non-Jewish Jews who were not Jewish who were drawn to the Frankfurt School. Um, and then also, uh, then, well, this, but that, that struck, that, there's more to say about that, but that has struck, I don't know what your thoughts are about that, but it struck me as an interesting piece of the, of the story. Well, it's very, very historically specific. That is to say, after the Second World War and lasting really well into the, um, you know, well through the end of the 20th century, uh, because of anti-Semitism, because of the Holocaust, uh, the Jews occupied a powerful place uh, as the uh, exemplum of uh, the absolute victim uh, and the uh, ne plus ultra, we might say, of, of inhumanity. And so many people, I think, felt in a kind of almost philo-Semitic way that they, you know, the, the, the cry, we are all German Jews in 1968, that, that, that kind of identification. Now, that's obviously less the case in the 21st century, and there are many reasons why. Yeah. Uh, but uh, for the period when we're, you know you and I were sort of getting into this in the '60s, that was still, I think, uh, an available identification. Now, one could say the Frankfurt School never quite went in that uh, completely towards that um, 
argument, but nonetheless understood the what might be called uh, role of the Jews as the quintessential non-identical figure uh, in uh, Western culture. Remember Adorno's uh, critique of identity theory and the idea that concepts need to be uh, always in some sense uh, undermined by or uh, mediated by the non-conceptual. Uh, that something which is positive always needs somehow to be aware of the uh, negative residue which uh, troubles its uh, complacency. And so the Jews became, and this is a kind of what might be called allegorical and figural use of the Jews as a category, became the quintessential uh, provocation, we might say, uh, against the idea that Western civilization, basically Christian civilization, uh, was somehow uh, complete, totalized, uh, identical with itself, that there was always an other. And so now, of course, we're very familiar with the vocabulary of difference and otherness. But one might say that the Jews were, in many respects, the diasporic Jews in particular, were in many respects the or example of otherness. And so the Frankfurt School, I think, felt a certain identification with that uh, in their own lives, uh, their own quintessential otherness, that they couldn't ever be fully and completely at home in the world that uh, Adorno's sense uh, of being, uh, living, uh, you know, lives that were damaged and, you know, that term I used, uh, permanent exiles, so they were always never, you know, always in exile, never fully at home. Uh, the wandering Jew, something that Krakauer, Siegfried Krakauer also talked about in History of the Last Things Before the Last when he discusses the metaphor of the wandering Jew. So there's that dimension of it. Now, there are many others that we could talk about, but I think that's one aspect of how both people who come from Jewish backgrounds, however assimilated, however committed or observant, uh, and those who then, through a process of identifying with victims, identifying with those who've been oppressed, become, uh, you know, somehow, as you call them, non-Jewish Jews from non-Jewish backgrounds. Does that make sense? Yeah, not only does it make sense, but I think that, that um, practically the lucidity of the comments that you just offered to us, uh, it, it, you find I, I just I loved reading this. I love reading your writing because it has that same uh, that same. You're able to um, to present with such clarity some some very complicated uh, ideas, and I, that does makes it makes a lot of sense. It also strikes me. It, it puts it puts me in mind of. Um, I, I don't have my copy uh, here, but in Marcuse's Eros and Civilization, he, uh, from 1955, there's a passage in there, which I know it, it, it struck, well, there's a passage in there where it isn't to the Jew that he refers as an example of otherness, but it's a very brief passage, and I don't think there's a lot more like it, where he refers to the, the figure of the homosexual, as the embodiment of the other, of the a kind of, of, of a figural homosexual in the same sense of the Jew. And he, he doesn't use the word gay, <laughs> but it also, <clears throat> I think in the, and there was a, <clears throat> Marcuse's book in particular, I mean, Eros and Civilization, before Foucault uh, emerges in the, in, the, in the middle and later 70s and his critique of the kind of neo-Marxist conception of sexual liberation that from the, in the period after 1968-69 Stonewall for the next six or seven years, Eros and Civilization was one of the main resources for intellectuals and theorists who were engaged in what was then called gay liberation. I mean, and Paul Robinson's book on the Freudian left is one sort of outcome of that, but uh, Dennis Altman in Australia was was using Eros and Civilization to develop a, a gay critique of contemporary, uh, you know, Western bourgeois society. And uh, something similar, it seems to me, happens. And it's partly, it's, I mean, the, the interesting case of who you mentioned of Angela Davis as Marcuse's sort of most famous black student that uh, after One Dimensional Man came out, uh, uh, that book and Marcuse and then some of the Frankfurt theorists found resonance among uh, African-American intellectuals in the United States uh, as well. And this kind of, a, a, yeah, I'm so go, yeah, 
Go ahead. Well, I, you know, one can see this as a kind of floating category, the category of otherness, a floating signifier, which is used to designate uh, marginalization, uh, used to designate uh, being marked rather than unmarked, uh, being used basically to identify people uh, or groups uh, who are, uh, for one reason or another, stigmatized. Now, the irony of that, the irony of stressing difference in otherness, uh, the irony of putting it in a generic category of the other or the different, is that somehow it has the danger of then homogenizing the heterogeneous into a simple category. So I would say one of the lessons, as it were, of critical theory is that uh, whenever we fall back on some sort of larger category, it's always important to be aware of what is in excess of that category. So the Jew, the homosexual, the black, the, you know, you just fill in whatever, the Muslim, you know, we have many candidates for this, uh, in a way, oddly stigmatized, but also sometimes heroized category of the transgressed uh, and therefore somehow, uh, somehow victimized other. We have to be very careful about avoiding turning them into simply exemplars of a type, exemplars of a category, making them nothing but uh, allegorically similar. And this is, of course, one of the great things that uh, we've learned with intersectionality, with all the different ways in which we try to figure out how all the pieces fit or don't fit together. Uh, and I think critical theory is, uh, in some sense, helpful, but doesn't give us all the answers. So on the question of gay liberation or just attitudes towards sexual deviation, otherness, whatever, their record is mixed. Uh, there are places in minimum morality, for example, where Adorno says certain things that uh, would now and even then seem embarrassing that you know homosexuals were tough in sadistic ways and the Nazis da da da. There are various places where uh, recent gay critics have found uh, things to question uh, in some of the arguments. Now, not all, and of course we now know from the letters that we uh, have between Horkheim uh, between I'm sorry Adorno and Krakauer that when Adorno was very young, he and Krakauer had an immensely intense personal and very likely physical relationship. So that he knew of, of, of this on an experiential level, uh, broke with it, uh, I think, uh, you know, was very much of a kind of womanizer, you want to call it, use that kind of word later, but nonetheless was aware of the fact that this was a human temptation and a human way of being. But the way they dealt with it was mixed. So I think even though, as you say, era civilization could be used, uh, we don't, I think, you know, you can't find all the answers in their work. Uh, to all these questions. And that's when there have been quite a number of articles uh, on this precise issue, which have tried to tease out uh, aspects of the work which are, uh, you know, for, from our perspective, progressive, and other aspects which are uh, more, let's say, a product of their own period, representing their own prejudices. And the same thing we might say with their attitude towards feminism. I mean, it's quite clear that, you know, late in his life, Marcuse picked up feminism, either from Ricky Sharover's third wife or just the zeitgeist. But in the practice of the school, if you look at the actual, you know, previous 50 years or whatever, women played a very marginal role. And Gretel Adorno, who is a very, I, I think, brilliant and interesting woman, you can read her letters to uh, Walter Benjamin, the letters uh, of two equal intellects writing to one another, was you know, basically a marginalized figure in the school's history, taking dictation from, uh, Marcuse, uh, from uh, Horkheimer and Adorno, and there were no other major women in the, uh, you know, the inner circle of the school. So the practice was typical, we might say, of that period. It was not, I mean, Hannah Arendt, there were a few counterexamples, but women did not play the role that we now uh, feel they should. So I think one has to be a little wary of seeing them as always as progressive in terms of actual practices and even some of those ideas as we'd like them to be. And I think this is that theory, and this is a position I've always taken, is a body uh, or a moving body of thought which has many, many uh, uh, positive, useful, interesting, suggestive uh, current dimensions, but also problems uh, that uh, was somehow represent their own period that they are, uh, themselves work through, move beyond, or which you know we can happily leave behind. It's not a tradition that needs to be uh, presented uh, as if it were a block, monolithically uh, uniform, and kept uh, in amber or an aspect, whatever you want to call it. But nonetheless, should be seen as ongoing. And that's why I find people like uh, Habermas and Honet and Rainer Forst and other contemporary theorists who are in the tradition useful correctives to some of the earlier positions uh, that uh, the Frankfurt School took. Uh, 
So this book is only on the first generation of the Franks. My right. last book, uh, Reason After Its Eclipse, dealt mostly with uh, what happened with Habermas and his uh, you know, version of critical theory, which I, I find quite attractive in some ways. So that's my, my kind of somewhat sloppy, but nonetheless, uh, I think, uh, you know, heartfelt answer to what we can take on questions like a liberation or whatever from their yeah. uh, tradition. So when you, Marty, when you uh, think about today, say the Republican National Convention or Trump or the, the present moment, do you find yourself, I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm putting, I, I, obviously you don't do this in a schematic way, but uh, d would you wanna, could you reflect a little bit on what you, what you find living and useful for figuring out the present moment and what you find that and what you where you you look to other theorists or other thinkers say for for things but just thinking about yeah the, today well there's no question that there has been a renewed interest in critical theory during the era of trump partly because its analysis and studies and prejudice and elsewhere of a certain kind of demagogic politics now seems to resonate and i mentioned at the very beginning semi-jokingly uh, Leo Lowenthal's uh, book, which he wrote with Norbert Guterman, Prophets of Deceit, which goes through various techniques used by demagogues. And, you know, if, if you just look at the, uh, the Republican rhetoric, you see how effective it still is. Uh, Dorno also did a book uh, uh, on a demagogue during the 1940s, uh, which is published posthumously, which goes through the techniques. So just on that pragmatic level of how you stir up uh, demagogically uh, a mob, um, uh, they had a, a very, I would say, insightful analysis. Uh, then, of course, in the authoritarian personality, there was an attempt to understand and pathologize the psychodynamics uh, of a certain kind of authoritarian politics. I'm a little less keen on using that in a simplistic way, simply because it implies turning your opponents into uh, pathologized uh, and, uh, in some sense, um, uh, determined by their own unconscious uh, uh, minors rather than full adults responsible for their ideas. So my general feeling is that one has to, and this is the Habermasian in me, uh, uh, treat even your opponents with the dignity that assumes they can argue and you can argue with them, and also that they're worthy of being listened to even though they may uh, be spouting nonsense that you want to refute, uh, rather than immediately putting them into some sort of category, pointing to them and saying they're authoritarian personalities and have to be uh, somehow either re-educated in a kind of somewhat uh, sinister way, putting them in the camps the way the Uyghurs are put in camps in, uh, East, uh, in Western Ch uh, China. Uh, the third dimension, which I tried to deal with in a piece that I did about six months ago in um, uh, the Los Angeles Review of Books, is a theory that they developed of gangster society, which they uh, never fully published, but which created in the 1940s a number of very interesting suggestive ideas about how uh, traditional uh, both market economies uh, based on the laws of capitalism or the workings of the capitalist marketplace on the one hand and a legal system based on the rule of law were being undermined by a society of personal relationships of loyalty, of protection, uh, of power, uh, of a kind of graft and corruption which uh, allows uh, gangsters really to uh, assume uh, a certain amount of uh, power, which was, so they argued the case before the modern world. I would say the gangster model was one they projected backwards. And one could argue that the Trump world that we now see in front of us, and the Steve Bannon mess of last week is uh, almost uh, too easy a textbook case of this, shows the extent to which these guys really are gangsters, and that they really are con men, grifters, people who are engaged in a kind of uh, struggle for power, which knows no legal bounds. And the Franklin School had an analysis of this, which I think uh, is uh, still quite suggestive. So these are among the ways in which the ideas are, I think, uh, still uh, perhaps relevant today. Yeah. That, that's, yeah, that's, um, I mean, I, it, it, it occurred to me when, in the beginning of the Trump administration, when Paul Manafort was sort of front and center, I followed that case with a certain amount of relief, but it was a very small kind of relief that corruption is right there from the, in the beginning. That is, this is a gangster operation from the start. It's, 
it doesn't have the purity of, say, the National Socialist Party of Germany. It doesn't have, it, it's, much, it's much more corrupt and there's much more self-interest in each of the, the figures in it. They're not submitting themselves. Anyway, that's, yeah. I, mean, I, I would say, you know, there's a tendency to say that Trump and company are proto-fascist. What differentiates them from the Nazis in particular is the fact that Nazis really did have an ideology, utopian ideology, from our perspective, deeply dystopian, from theirs utopian, which they believed in, in a way that uh, was frighteningly effective in the world. That is to say, they used it to kill uh, six million Jews and other terrible things that, uh, you know, basically were, from a pragmatic point of view, counterproductive. The gangster model says there are no values, that basically it's power, protection, uh, it's the spoils of the system, it's uh, basically loyalty, it's basically demanding a kind of almost feudal relationship, but without having any transcendent ideals. So that fascism, at least, this is a good or bad thing, had uh, principles uh, which it followed, not always, not everybody, but in ways that allowed them uh, to uh, seduce people into believing their ideas. In the Trump world, it's hard to see what people really, I mean, we don't want to get off a discussion of this, but uh, the ideas, I mean, Trump is not a guy who leads with ideology. You know, it's something else, some other appeal. Look, we're getting on to Trump. Maybe what we should do is open it up for questions. Yes, I was going to say. That, that deal with other things, deal with maybe the book rather than Trump, because yes, all of us have yeah. opinions of mine and are better than anybody else's on this. So maybe it's time to see if uh, Peter has amassed a few questions. Yeah, no one has uh, asked any questions yet. This is your chance, folks. Please do use the uh, chat function that's at the bottom of your screen to ask the questions, and I can read them off. Uh, but if you want to continue, you know, the well, first sure. there no, there no, I will, you know, kind of call the questions. Sure, no, I'm, ha I'm happy to. I'm happy to. I just didn't want to yeah. stop before we, uh, you know, have sure. chance. Sure. No, the, thank you. Yeah. The actual audience. One of the. Um, the, one of the uh, very exciting things that seems to me about this book, and it's noted in the, the very nice um, the, the blurb, so to speak, it, that, that the City Lights Books put, puts out, how much attention uh, there is in this book and the essays to, um, to images and to the visual. There's, that is, there's not only a lot of art history in this, but even the, for example, jumping from, from Trump to the, to the, 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 the wonderful essay on uh, on Walter Benjamin as a stamp collector, for example, which has in it three pages of just a, a fascinating history of the postage stamp uh, and your own experience as a as a young philatelist, um, uh, and 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 in the the the, the chapter on on the um, um, Walter Benjamin and the the liberation of color and his his discussions of Kandinsky and the Blaue Reiter, um, it was you. You have moved in in the later part of your career. Uh, I mean, you really have taken art history and visual history, image history has really become part of your repertoire. It's impressive. Well, thanks. I mean, this opens up also a, a totally different dimension. Uh, critical theory is very interested in the senses, very interested in aesthetics as always filtered through the body and of course uh, music in particular in Adorno's case but uh, Benjamin was very interested in photography and cinema so the issue of color comes up in one of the other essays I don't think I can uh, you know do justice to it but the point about non-conceptuality is that ideas thoughts concepts are always in some ways in tension with uh, the central experiences that somehow uh, uh, transgress and transcend them and uh, the ability of uh, art, visual arts, to provide some sort of alternative to philosophy without having necessarily uh, being opposed to philosophy is always a kind of, uh, let's say, complementarity is part of the larger story. So uh, I think I, I don't want to go off into the visual now because I think there are a couple of questions I see on, on the screen. Uh, but I think that's one way in which uh, this bleeds into earlier work I did on uh, the denigration vision in French thought and work I've done on photography and so forth. Okay, so I saw a couple of questions. I didn't actually see all of them. So maybe, Peter, do you want to flash oh, the ones? I don't see them. 
Yeah, there were a couple that were on there, and then I, but they yeah, weren't fully. Yeah, I can read them off to you. Yeah, um, read them off. That'd be good. Yeah, sure, sure. So what can the Frankfurt School contribute to contemporary discussions of race beyond the question of anti-Semitism? Right. Well, I think it's an excellent question. They were uh, not as focused on uh, issues of race in the sense that we now are focused on them uh, that uh, allow us to see in their work I think a powerful inspiration uh, for contemporary discussions of these issues. If we extrapolate from the uh, work on anti-Semitism, there are ideas which are valuable, but as I said earlier, I'm a little loath to make every version of otherness uh, equivalent. So the history of anti-Jewish prejudice uh, and the structural anti-Semitism that's existed in many different contexts is not the same thing as the history and the contemporary practice, we might say, of uh, structural racism against other minority groups. So I would not frankly go to critical theory for uh, true uh, inspiration on this particular issue. It's not a blind spot, uh, but it's certainly not a place where they developed ideas in uh, very powerful ways. The same thing, for example, questions of, of nationalism. They never really developed a strong discussion of that. And as I mentioned earlier, in the question of, of uh, women's uh, uh, and uh, gay issues, they moved in the right direction, but they uh, are not, I think, the major source of inspiration that we need to take today for addressing those ideas. So it's a slightly disappointing question. I, I know there are probably people who've done work that has teased out of the tradition more than I'm suggesting now, but I think by and large, it was not the focus of, of their work. I have another question. How would you differentiate between the first and second generation theorists from the latest generation? And can you say something about the philosopher Gillian Rose? Ah, those are two immense questions. I mean, obviously, uh, the Frankfurt School's history, one of the things that's kept it going is the fact that it's had successive generations. I mean, one can't look at the history, for example, of uh, other Western Marxist thinkers, uh, Korsh or Gramsci or others, and see quite as clear a series of subsequent generations that uh, developed ideas that were derived from and nonetheless uh, involved new departures. So the Habermasian initiative, we might call it, uh, which I don't discuss in this book, but talk about quite a bit in reason uh, after its eclipse, involves a, a wholly new attempt to ground critical theory in uh, a version of language, uh, which uh, is very problematic, difficult to describe now, and also a much more, we might say, uh, tempered attitude towards what is politically feasible, uh, less Marxist in a direct sense, more uh, positive towards the uh, let's call it effects of the dialectic of enlightenment, less critical rationality and so forth. Uh, and then there are other figures like uh, Albrecht Vellmer and Axel Honneth that I mentioned, Ron of Forst, maybe a third generation, who developed in still other ways. And here we would really be in trouble if we tried to uh, give, to do justice to their ideas. But I would suggest that what makes critical theory fascinating is the fact that it has been ongoing rather than uh, basically uh, frozen uh, and uh, ossified tradition. I have another question here. Um, in what sense does the Frankfurt School tradition of critical, in quotes, offer a specific and powerful an analytical frame that should be preserved? Well, I think critique in general uh, is a very, very powerful term uh, that has many different uh, usages over time. You can find it, of course, in Kant's critiques, which are essentially uh, philosophical, epistemological, and so forth, or moral. You can find it in critique of political economy and Marx. Uh, you can find it in a general sense uh, of uh, critique as a way to ask questions about the power behind uh, systems of knowledge that allows even Foucault to be seen as a critical theorist. So it's a very broad term, and critique also uh, involves uh, other I would say, uh, more recent uh, bodies of thought that uh, enrich and sometimes, of course, are in conflict with earlier notions of critique. Uh, one of the great issues that critique is always faced with is the issue of how 
you found it? What is its point of brief from which it's launched? How does one come up with a uh, way to create a normative alternative to uh, simply describing the world? And critical theory has struggled with this. And in this book, uh, in, uh, in uh, Splinters, I do, in one of my essays, try to wrestle with this. And I don't have a very hard and fast answer. And I think in some ways the critique is grounded not in its origins, not in a ground in that uh, very uh, physical metaphor of something which is firm and a foundation, but rather in a uh, future, in a telos, in an aspiration, in a hope, in some sort of, uh, we might say, uh, impatience with the world as it is and a desire for a world as it might be. So this is you know, very open-ended and critique is not something which I think should be seen as fixed, but is rather uh, a kind of attitude or uh, a practice rather than uh, something that involves hard and fast positive statements. And Marcuse's stress on negation rather than positive thought is, I think, very much part of that. I have uh, yet another question. Uh, in the intersection of all the figures of the Frankfurt School, there is Heidegger. How do you approach the Heideggerian effect on the Frankfurt School? Well, this is also enormously fraught. I mean, Marcuse was, of course, a student of Heidegger's, and his early work tried to combine Marx and Heidegger. He ultimately moved beyond this, and so his two books on Hegel, Hegel's ontology, written for Heidegger, and then Reason and Revolution, written when he was with the Institute, are very different. Heidegger, nonetheless, and Andy Feinberg and many people who have tried to write about Marcuse and uh, Heidegger uh, have shown us that there's still a lot of uh, Heidegger in Marcuse. Adorno was always a bit more critical, uh, maybe even more than a bit, and certainly works like Jargon of Authenticity or Negative Dialectics take Heidegger on in a very negative way. But there have been people who have written books trying to say that despite his uh, overt hostility, there are nonetheless many points of convergence. Uh, Alexander Garcia Dutman, for example, uh, a number of other people have written books that have tried to make Heidegger and Adorno, uh, to put them in conversation with one another. Now, these are highly technical, difficult issues. One might say that Heidegger was also, like critical theory, aware of the deficiencies of traditional idealist, positivist, scientific thought, where they diverged, obviously, were in their uh, political uh, inclinations, and also in uh, basic attitudes towards ontology and towards ethics. And uh, this would take us into very deep waters indeed. But it's a question worth addressing. Uh, as I say, for the opposition between them, read jargon of authenticity, but there are places in which there are clear overlaps and people have tried to find, I mean, I think, for example, of uh, Fred Dalmeyer or Gerhard Richter tried to find ways in which you can enrich one by the other. Uh, others, uh, other critics have found, know that they really are uh, in very different camps and ought not to be confused. So I don't want to uh, adjudicate that now. It's too difficult a question. Okay. Uh, I have yet another question. I think we have time for maybe two more. What can the Frankfurt School contribute to non-Western world, e.g. the Ulgar issue in Western China? Is critical theory applicable to political contexts? Well, I think it's obviously Eurocentric in its origins. Uh, they were relatively different. Karl August Wittfogel wrote on China for them during the 1920s, 30s, and into the 40s, but uh, basically, they were not uh, schooled in uh, non-European, uh, or at least non-Western, they had, of course, the American experience, non-European thought, and uh, scarcely spent any time outside of uh, the, let's call it, NATO world. Having said that, there have been people, uh, Asha Bharat Harajan, for example, did a book called Exotic Parodies, which argued that Adorno was as useful, maybe even more so, than uh, Derrida and uh, even Said for uh, work on uh, post-colonial theory. Said himself was very taken with Adorno. Uh, and other people, uh, Tom McCarthy, for example, have uh, tried to apply some of their ideas outside of Europe. So I would say it's possible with a certain uh, wariness about uh, the, uh, let's say, parochial origins of the thought to find uh, stimulation for uh, theories that are not uh, simply based on European experience. Uh, but uh, one has to work on that, and uh, the imbalance is very clear. And I think one ought not to flinch from that reality that they basically operated with uh, an understanding that was circumscribed by their own experience in Europe and the United States.
That is actually about all we have time for. Uh -huh. I wish this could go on as to having such a great time. Um, really like to thank you, Martin J, Paul Brynus, uh, Robert Kaufman. We're also very grateful to our friends at Verso for, for publishing this very essential book and also to the Program in Critical Theory at the University of California at Berkeley for co-presenting tonight's event. And thanks to all of you in the Zoom room for joining us. I have posted links in the texting window uh, to purchase tonight's book. It really does help us continue hosting events like this and also keeps City Lights alive as a cultural center and fiscally afloat. So it's a difficult time for indies at the moment. Um, Every little sale helps, so we need your support. Uh, to learn more about upcoming events, please visit our website, www.citylights.com. Uh, today's event is going to be rebroadcast on YouTube. If you know anyone who could not make it, uh, please let them know. You can just Google YouTube plus City Lights Live plus Martin J. So we look forward to having you join us again in the near future. One and all, have an excellent evening. Be safe and be well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, one final word. I, I feel a lot of questions unanswered. If people want to email me, I, I often like to get into these little discussions. There were a couple of questions that were quite critical, and I'm more than happy to hear criticism. So, you know, let's uh, keep the conversation going, and I hope the book uh, will stimulate rather than uh, satisfy uh, your uh, feelings uh, about critical theory. Thanks again. Thank you.